You know, in the old days, they knew him by the page numbers. Now, I, I don't know it like that. Some of y'all do. They knew what page number it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with me. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be continuing our Just Jesus series for this month of October. Again, I tell you next week, Apostle Andre Fonsel will be with us bringing the word, and then we'll close out our series on the 31st of October, Lord willing. But I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I come today uh, slightly in betwixt until I came in the sanctuary this morning. I had another thing I was going to preach. Uh, and sometimes when the Lord tells you to do something and he doesn't give you the reason behind it until it's time, uh, it, can, it can be hard discerning what he wants you to say. And I had something to say because uh, if you're, you know, either just coming back from COVID or you've been here now for the months, you know, the year that we've been back open since COVID, um, in the last six weeks, we have seen miracle after miracle. I mean, bodies healed, people's minds mended, people walking in on crutches and leaving without them, spines straightened back up. And I was going to come in here and I was going to preach, preach around that for a minute. Because the Bible said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33 that Peter was preaching about the Pentecost, about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming, and he said, that which you see and hear, Jesus has poured out. And the reason that we are seeing miracles and we are seeing signs and wonders and we are seeing God do things is because of Jesus. He has poured them out. And some people say, well, the Holy Ghost stopped being poured out when the apostles ascended. That's a lie. And it's deceit and deception that is creeping into our day. God is still healing. He is still saving. He is still delivering. Hey, guess what? He is still baptizing people in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. He's still doing that. But it's Jesus that does that. It's Jesus that does that. And as I was preparing today, the Holy Spirit told me, that I must focus us on our soon coming king. It's the title of my message today, our soon coming king. Everything we are doing, every song we sing, every message we preach, every time we gather, it is unto something. You're going somewhere. Whether you know it or not, you are going to spend eternity in one of two places. You're going to spend eternity in heaven with God, the creator of all things, and his son, Jesus. Or you're going to spend eternity in hell. Don't get mad at me. People say, well, why would a loving God send people to hell? Why would people choose to go to hell over heaven? God's not sending anybody anywhere. At this point, you are choosing. That's why it's called free will. You are free to choose if you're going to spend your life in eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. Well, y'all thought I was going to ease into this this morning. And everything we are doing is unto something. The culmination of all creation is in the soon return of Jesus Christ. Now, I know some people say, well, the rapture is not in the Bible, the word rapture. No, you're right. The word rapture is a, is a Latin word that means to transport from one place to another. You know what's in the Bible? A theology and a doctrine that says one day we will be transported from one place to another. And it will be at the return of Christ. There's also doctrines of pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. I, we get caught up on the dumbest things. The fact of the matter is he's coming. And if, if you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, that shouldn't matter. You should be in any second Christian. He could come before we leave this gathering today. He could come before you get home. He could come before you go to work tomorrow. He could come in 10 to 15 years. The fact is, no man knows the day or the hour, so we ought to live like we don't know the day or the hour. All right, I wanted to get that out of the way before we started. 
So I won't be talking, I won't be getting into all this divisive th theological and doctrinal stuff. If you want to know my position, you can come talk to me. The fact of the matter is Jesus is coming. And we ought to live like he's coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, quickly. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left, will be caught up, somebody say caught up, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord. Therefore, verse 18, encourage one another with these words. With these words. Holy Spirit, help us today. Before I dive into this scripture, I need to give you a little bit of backdrop of what is occurring in our society and the day and age in which we live. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 beginning, uh, Tim, uh, Paul writing to Timothy begins to expound. And he says to his son in the faith, Timothy, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Hello. Perilous times shall come. Men will be lovers of their own selves. I want you to hear the prophetic pen of Paul. Men will be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Huh? Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Here's one for you. Unholy. That word makes lukewarm Christians vomit in their mouth. Holiness. The Bible said without holiness, no man, no woman, no child will see God without holiness. Unholy. Here's one for you. I might get in trouble here. Without natural affection. God created us male and female. And he intended for marriage to be between male and female. And anything outside of those bounds is an abomination and in opposition to the Bible. It is not natural affection. It is a spirit of perversion. Because the devil doesn't have original ideas. He's a dummy. So he's got to take what God has created and he just perverts it. It's a spirit of perversion. Now some of you say, well, that's hateful. No, it's not. It's in the Bible. It's the truth. It's the truth. Come on now. And that doesn't mean that we treat people who are struggling with homosexual behavior and homosexual uh, attraction any differently. Come on now. Jesus was the only perfect man that walked the planet. And do you know who he sat with the most? Sinners. We don't accept it, but we love them. But the Bible said, listen... The Bible said that in the last days, a people without natural affection would be a blaring sign that we are living in the last days. Then he would go on and he would say, truce breakers. The word of men means nothing anymore. And when I say men, I mean mankind. Truce breakers, false accusers. Hello. I want, you to, I want you to think about this in the context of our society. False accusers, traitors, heady, high-minded. Listen to this one. Lovers of pleasure. 
more than lovers of God. More. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to beat anybody up over this. I don't want you to feel condemned over this. I want you to feel convicted. Because whatever you love more than God is an idol. Whatever you give more of your time to is an idol. Come on now. They would love pleasure more than loving God. It's amazing. Every church in America in the summer, the attendance dips because Sundays have started to become nice outside. And so people want to take a day and spend the day outside on the boat, fishing, golfing, whatever, and they're taking away from a day we have set aside for the Lord and giving it to pleasure. Oh, you got real quiet in here. Baby, there are six other days in the week. One, one day a week for the Lord. And it should be seven days a week. It, commitment's hard for people. And he said, in the last days, they will love pleasure more than they love God. And that would lead them to have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What's he saying? They would come to church. Come on now. They'd come to church. Some pastors and preachers would preach. Some musicians and worshipers will worship. But they will have no power. We'll become like the church of Sardis. Who's got a name that says we should be alive but we're dead. And it's the crippling of our day. It's what Jesus spoke of when he said, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. They'll say, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not preach in your name? Did we not lay hands on the sick and they were healed in your name? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. What a horrifying statement for him to make. That you can be so deceived to think that you can have a position or you can have a title or you can work miracles or you can preach really good or you can pray really well or you can sing really good. And guess what, baby? You can still go to hell. I know it's hard. I'm going to make it better in a minute. Or the Holy Ghost is going to make it better. But one of the things we're lacking in our day is truth. And I I love the Lord and I fear him too much to come here on a Sunday morning and have an audience with you for an hour on a Sunday morning and not give you truth. And I fear God more than I fear you. I just want to throw that out there. That makes me a dangerous man. Because I don't care what you think. Oh, Lord. Let me get back behind here. I don't care what you have to say. I'm thankful that you give. But I serve a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So your money doesn't move me. And the truth is we are so lukewarm, we are so distracted, we are so overtaken by titles and positions and authority and influence that we have been deceived into thinking influence equals salvation, anointing equals salvation, being used equals salvation. You can be used, you can be anointed, you can be gifted, you can have apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, bishop in front of your name and you can still go to hell if he does not know you. Peter prophesied in 2 Peter 3. And he said, this know that in the last days scoffers will come. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep. Things have continued as they were since the beginning. I'll keep it up here with me. The devil's a liar. He's mad. We're living in the last days. We're living in these scoffers would come. And I think the Holy Ghost was setting me up this morning. Because as I was 
as we were away this week, and I would get on social media occasionally throughout being away, I saw two or three people that just straight up denounced the coming of the Lord. What else is there? What, what are we going to? What is the end goal? If the coming of the Lord doesn't exist, what is the end goal? Because the Bible says scoffers would come. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? Verse 9 said, the Lord is not slack. Now, we, listen, we, we misquote this scripture all the time because we like to take Bible and twist it to fit our narrative. The Lord is not slack concerning, not his promises. That's true too. But this scripture said his promise. And in the context, it is talking about the coming of the Lord. The only reason the Lord has not come back yet is that he is still giving people time to be saved. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all, everybody say all, all should come to repentance. Repentance. And what were signs of the time? Luke 21 and 10. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, Kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity. Are you listening? Are you actively listening and thinking about our society, our world right now as I'm reading this scripture? The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up. Lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. This word pestilence is translated to mean plague. Hello? Public menace or troublemaker. Have you been alive the past year and a half? A plague, a public menace, a troublemaker, pestilences. Men's hearts would fail them from fear. The word fail here means to faint or be discouraged. Do you want to know one of the spiritual impacts of the virus that has hit the earth is fear. Fear. I'm not saying that wearing a mask means that you, we got to get over that. I'm not saying wearing a mask means you don't have fear. I'm not saying if you it doesn't mean you don't have faith. I'm not saying if you took a back, take the vaccine that you don't have faith. I don't, don't misquote this preacher. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is a spirit of fear has arrested the hearts of men. And now it's not about that thing anymore. I'm going to say that thing because I don't want us to get tagged on Facebook. It's not about that thing anymore. It's about fear over everything. Inflation. Come on now. Inflation, the, 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 the issues on the sea. China, North Korea, Afghanistan. There is an opportunity to be afraid everywhere you look. And the Bible said in the last days it would be so and men's hearts would fail them because of fear. But God has not given us a spirit of fear but a power of love and a sound mind. You are able to stand up in the midst of chaos and be in your right mind. You are able to stand up in the midst of confusion and have clarity and bring clarity. Oh, yes. And then Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, look up. Lift up your head. 
The word look means to straighten up. Get it together. Come on. How many of y'all have small children in the room? Just throw your hand up. You got small children in the room? And sometimes, listen, we just flew on a plane with three kids under five. Okay. And thanks be to God and my beautiful wife, I sat next to the one who was sleeping. And it was me and him, and there was nobody else in the row. But she had the two wild ones in the back. And, um, <laughs> and my Gwynny, she, you know, you get in a plane and your ears get stuffed. And she had headphones on too. And if she wanted something, she couldn't tell. She was talking so loud. So I'd be sitting, I have my, my AirPods in. I was, I was uh, watching a movie, and I would hear her. I want this. I turn around like, what in the name? I take them out. Nothing's wrong. She's just screaming as loud as she can because she don't know how loud she's talking. And then you get in public places and your kids start acting up. What do you say to them? Straighten up. Get it together. So when Jesus is saying, look up, in the original text, he wasn't saying, let your eyes look up. He was saying, get yourself together. Get your life aligned with the kingdom and your life aligned with God. Straighten up and then lift up your head. For your redemption draws near. We are so very close to the return of the Lord. We might get 10 years from now and still be here. And I will still be preaching. We are close to the return of the Lord. So let's walk through this. The Bible says the Lord himself shall descend. Everybody say descend. That word means to come down or to step down. Not an angel. Not David. Not the archangel Michael. Not Gabriel, not Joshua, not Daniel, not Paul, not Peter, not Elijah, not Elisha, but the Lord himself shall step down out of heaven. Acts chapter 1, you see the apostles have been uh, uh, commissioned by God, by Jesus. And the Bible said he told them to tarry here until the promise of the Holy Spirit and they'll be endued with power. And in verse 11, the Bible said that Jesus ascended into the heavens. And there was a group of people standing by. And two men in white came down and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into the heavens? For this same Jesus that you have seen go into heaven. He shall so come again in life. Like manner in John 14 and 1 beginning the Bible said uh, that don't he said don't let your hearts be troubled if you believe in God believe also in me for I go to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you I will surely come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also in Revelation 22 and 3 the Bible said that we will see his face and his name shall be in in our forehead and I stop right here for a minute to tell you there is coming a day it might be tomorrow it might be before we leave it might be five or ten years from now but there is coming a day when the Lord himself will step down out of heaven and we are going to see Jesus I often wonder when I sit in funerals or when I do them and people who are saved I sit there and wonder, what are they doing right now? What are they do? What are they doing? They've seen the one whom they worshipped. Come on now. There's coming a day I'm going to see Jesus. I don't care about David. I don't care about Peter. I don't care about Paul. They're great men of the Bible. I want to see Jesus. I'm going to see him. I'm going to stand before his face. And all the years of preaching, all the years of worship, all the years of sacrifice, can I tell you, 
all the years of pain, all the years of turmoil, of heartache, of betrayal, every moment in that time will be worth it. <laughs> worth it. Every sickness, every disease, every moment that I felt like it wasn't worth it anymore, when I see Jesus, it'll be worth it. I'm going to be in heaven. Somebody shout heaven. heaven. Heaven is a real place. It's not something somebody made up somewhere. It's a real place. John the Revelator saw it in Revelation chapter 4. And he described it. It's a real place. Philippians chapter 3 and 20, Paul says this, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown, stand fast in the Lord. Heaven is a real place. I want you to listen to me. It's a real place, and it is for people who have been redeemed, not people who are good. It's for people who have been washed in the blood, not people who give to charity. Just give to charity. As a believer, you should be generous. Y'all know what I'm saying. Are you better? Not of works, lest any man should boast. My works do not save me. But my works prove I'm saved. My works don't save me. My, my, my living righteously, my giving, my love for other people, that is not what saves me. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and because I'm redeemed, I give. Because I'm redeemed, I love. Because I'm redeemed, I value, I give my time, my effort, my energy, I witness. I'm a believer because I'm saved. I'm not saved because I do those things. And there is this movement of, well, just, just, just love people, just love everybody, just, just stand up for everybody and do this. And that. That's great. But if you're not washed in the blood and living according to the standard of Scripture, you can love everybody all the way to hell. There's this whole, oh man, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble today. There's this whole movement of being woke. You could go woke, you could be woke and go straight to hell. You can bend your knee to a culture who wants to bend the scriptures and break the scriptures and conform to an image that is not God. You can do all of that, come into church and worship and still go to hell. Heaven is for redeemed people, not people who do good things. It's a real place with real streets of gold, with colors our eyes can't even imagine, jewels our eyes can't even imagine. Heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven. Okay, three of you are going to go with me. I said, I can't wait to get to heaven. Have. Jesus coming down, but then he said to come down with a shout. In Jewish culture, you'd ha you need to go study the way that they did marriage in Jewish culture. It will make the coming of the Lord make so much more sense. I don't have time to dive into all of it, but this is one area that I will. When the groom's father in a marriage decided that everything was in place, he would release his son to go get the bride. The son nor the bride knew when the father would release the son. This is This is historical. Neither the son nor the father would know when the, son, when the son was going to be released to go get the bride. The groom, okay, I'll give you a little bit of historical insight. The bride would sit up in her wedding chamber with a lamp 
with oil and extra oil seated by because she didn't know when the groom was coming. And when the father released the son, the groom would go and arrive at the bride's house, listen to this, with a shout and a blowing of the shofar. Then the groom would take the marriage contract to the father of his intended bride. He would claim her as his own. Then he would take her to his father's house. His father would be waiting to receive the couple. Then the groom's father would take the hand of the bride and place it on the hand of his son. And at that moment, she became his wife. In Jewish culture, it was called the presentation. There's coming a day we're going to hear the sound of a trumpet. I, I'm not ta- I don't believe it's going to be a brass trumpet. We're going to hear the sound of a shofar, I believe, light up the sky. And then the next sound we'll hear is a voice of the archangel Michael saying, come up. Come up. Then he said, the dead in Christ will rise first. 2 Corinthians 5 and 8 said, we are confident, I say willing rather, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What is Paul saying? Your grandmama that went on before you that knew the Lord, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your family member, your friend that went on before you in the ways of the Lord and was redeemed, they will rise first. Somebody just shout, then we. That's me. That's me and that's you. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up. We shall be extracted. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. He said that this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then will the saying come to pass, O death, where is your sting? And O grave, where is your victory? So the dead in Christ will rise first, then me and you will be caught up together with them in the air. To be with him forever. (laughs) Then he said, comfort one another with these words. My brother, my sister, my friend. We are living in a world that is increasingly putting pressure on the people. And pressure on the body of Christ. So today, I comfort you with these words. Jesus is coming. And when you see him, split the eastern sky. The Bible said that he would come riding on a white horse. And his name is called Faithful and True. And with righteousness he judges and makes war. And on his thigh is written a name of which no one knows. And his vesture is dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. When he splits the sky and he comes, all the pain, all the heartache, all the pressure, All the consecration, all the separation, all the days that you fasted, all of the days that you said no to things that were going to be fun things, but they weren't aligned with the scripture. Every day is going to culminate in that moment, and it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. But now, as I get ready to close here in a moment, 
What is our response? I think a lot of times we want to come. I hope you leave today. I hope you leave today with joy, man. We're going to heaven. We're going to heaven. Like that, that's what awaits the believer. We're going to heaven. I'm going to see Jesus. I want to see you there too. I hope you leave with joy. But there has to be a response. Something has to happen on the inside of us when we hear he's coming that goes beyond joy. It affects our lifestyle. Three things and we're going to be done. Number one, our first response to his soon coming is that we have to live watching. Everybody say live watching. Live. Watching for two things. Number one, we watch for his return. Yes. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Looking for the looking, looking, looking. Somebody say looking. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. So number one, we watch for his coming. Number two, felt this strongly. We must be on the lookout for deception. Somebody say deception. deception. The scriptures explicitly state that a sign of the days preceding the coming of the Lord would be days of deception. Matthew 24 and 4, there's three levels to this. Are you listening? Number one, Matthew 24, 4 and 5, take heed that no one deceives you. You listening? That's number one. Take heed that no man deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, here's the second level, and will deceive many. I don't want to be in the many category. So how do I do that? I guard myself from deception by staying in his word. Okay. Verse 11, Matthew 24. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Do you want to know how, I believe it was Peter, defined false prophets? He defined false prophets as those who deny that Jesus is the Son of God. One of the mandates of a true prophet is to point people to Jesus. If they don't point you to Jesus and they call themselves a prophet, run. As far as you can. They will rise up and deceive many. That's the next level. Then the final level. Unless those days, verse 22, were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So you've got the level of personal deception, you've got the level of many being deceived, and then there is the level that unless the days were shortened, deception's going to be so bad that unless the days were shortened, not even the elect would be able to stand it. So Jesus is saying you must guard yourself from deception, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to seducing and deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Don't get me started there. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with the hot iron. Listen to the definition of these words. This word heed, it means to bring a ship to land or to touch at it. Seducing means wandering or vagabond. 
Spirits here is a word that means used of demons or evil spirits. So let's put it all together. What Paul is saying is that in the last days, many will depart from the faith. And there will come a time where they will welcome to the land. Like a ship on the ocean, evil spirits. They will pet. That's what the word means. They will touch at evil spirits. And doctrines of demons. <laughs> oh, man. If you're a believer and you actively use a horoscope for your identity, you, you, you need delivered. Come on now. If you're, I just feel like just stopping here and stepping on the devil's head for a minute. If you're a believer and, and you, you are using a Ouija board and you call yourself a believer, you need delivered. I'm not just talking about somebody come up here and lay hands on you and you fall out. No, you need delivered. You are under demonic control to do those things. Paul said we don't give a space to the devil. Now, no demon can be where the Holy Ghost is and stay. But as a believer, you absolutely can open the door to demonic activity in your life. Not just, and, and then I say horoscopes and Ouija boards and y'all are like, yeah, 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 but what about what you watch? What about who you're connected to? If I gave Erica Foster this microphone about sororities and the things that God delivered her out of, if you're not a Facebook friend with her, get, because she tells her testimony often. But God delivered her from that. You say, well, what's wrong with that? You need delivered. Oh, it got real quiet in the room. They would, listen, in the last days, they would touch evil spirits. What we ought to be casting out, we would welcome like a ship coming to shore. Okay. I'm, so, so we started on, y'all look like you were mad at me. I got you happy, and now I'm going to make you mad at me again before we leave. You need delivered. You need set free. You need to watch what you are welcoming to shore in your life. Okay, so we watch for his return. We watch for deception. That's number one. It's the first response. Then we live working. Everybody say working. working. Luke 19, 11. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into the far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants and delivered to them ten minas and said to them, do business till I come. One translation says, occupy until I come. One of the things that this disease that is in the land has done it has caused a laziness in the people of God. I just feel awfully free this morning. If you're watching online because you're being careful and you've got underlying conditions, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. But if you're watching online just because it's more comfortable. The Bible said in Hebrews 10 that as we see the day of the Lord approaching... We ought to gather together, not less, more. There's this, this comfort level that's come on the body of Christ, and now we're so comfortable, the devil's just taking territory left and right, and we're just sitting there like, well, as long as he doesn't take none of mine. Guess what? The longer you sit on it, the more comfortable you're going to become, and you won't even know. You'll become like Samson, who woke up one day and didn't even know the glory had left. And 
And we got pushed back, stumble. We become defensive, reacting. But the Bible said that we are to do business until he comes. What does that look like? The lost are being saved. The sick are being healed. The de- Come on now. Come on now. I know for a space in time there were people, well, you shouldn't lay hands on people. I, I, I heard from leadership gurus across all planes that, that the days of laying hands on people are done and we're never going to, that's a, that's a lie from the devil. Jesus said you will pick up unclean things and they won't harm you. You Come on now. You'll cast out demons in his name. You'll speak in new tongues in his name. And we've got to come to the point where we get out of laziness. We get out of comfort. And we step into an army role that we have been called to as the people of God. And we occupy until he comes. The hungry are being fed. The homeless are being clothed, but it goes beyond that. Our calling goes beyond that. The broken are being made whole. So it's not just homeless people being clothed. It's homeless people being clothed and rehabilitated, saved, working, living a life God has ordained and designed for them. Come on now. Come on now. I know I just got real practical and the whole place just, shh. What is our gospel if it's just for us to sit and to hear it? That's not a gospel I want to be involved in. We, we are, spi- time is, somebody come play because I'm going to keep talking. We are spiritually fat because we come to the table week after week after week and we eat and we eat and we eat and there is no stretching of our faith there is no exercising of the word that has been released there is no application of the word that is going forth and so we hear oh yeah the Lord is coming the Lord is coming and we have joy because we're going to heaven but there's people Dying and going to hell. And we're fine to be spiritually obese on a pew. I have been in more church services in my life than I care to count. And I've come to this place in my life that if this gospel is enough to save me from going to a hell that was meant for demons then it is sure enough, strong enough to get me out of my apathy and complacency and to walk into Walmart, Kroger, restaurants, the street to see somebody and to hear the voice of God speak to me for them and to go minister and witness to them and be a light in the darkness. If if this gospel is strong enough to save me, it is strong enough to empower me to live it. And the last thing, and now this, this may seem kind of out of the blue, but the Holy Ghost told me to put it in, so I did. We have to live watching. We have to live working. I want you to hear me. I'm almost done. We've got to live without offense. One of the signs of the last days is that many would be offended. Look at our culture. You say one thing right or one thing left, and a whole people group is offended. I have read so many things in the last year and a half that could have offended me. But you know what I did? I just kept on scrolling. You know why? The Holy Ghost spoke to me. And he said, son, there is nothing worth missing heaven over. Nothing. No Facebook argument. No disagreement. Not something somebody said to me. 
It's not worth it. Because the Bible says, listen, offense turns into unforgiveness. And God said, unless I forgive, he will not forgive me. This isn't a gospel we like. Unforgiveness can and will keep you out of heaven. Offense turns into unforgiveness. And guess what unforgiveness unchecked becomes? Bitterness. The scripture says, see to it that no root of bitterness take root in your heart. You get bitter at people. Your perception of people gets skewed. Because you were offended, you chose unforgiveness, and unforgiveness unchecked is bitterness. I believe, let me tell you something, I believe because I've seen bitterness opens a door for the enemy in your life. When we were in Mozambique a couple years ago. We ministered out in the bush, and as we were leaving to go back, there was a man, he hadn't had a, we're all adults in here, he hadn't had a bowel movement in close to two months. He lived in a hut, he sat in a chair, couldn't walk. So we went, and we prayed for him. Now my expectation is this man is going to have a bowel movement right there. And it's gonna be awesome. The first thing that God did was God strengthened his legs. He got up and started walking for the first time in weeks while we prayed. Then we began to go after that thing that was constricting his bowels. And the missionary we were with, she stopped us from praying and she began to speak to him in Portuguese, which is the language in Mozambique. And we began, well, you know, I was just listening. I was sitting inside praying, but I was like, Lord, if you want to give me the interpretation of what she's saying, that'd be great. Because I got no idea. She finishes with the man, she tur- and they're talking back and forth. She turns around and she said, the Holy Spirit told me that something happened to him when he was younger. And he put a voodoo curse on another man. And that if he did not renounce that and forgive that person, he could not be healed. You know what that man did? He walked, but he wasn't made whole. He walked, but the healing that God wanted to bring to his life, it wasn't the bowels, it was his heart. And we are so near to the coming of the Lord. There is nothing, nothing worth missing heaven over. Some people, they battle sickness after sickness after sickness. It's not because they're unhealthy. It's not because they did something this way or that way. It's because they've got bitterness in their life. Unforgiveness in their life. And that has opened the door for the enemy. And so we look at our soon coming king And to end this whole message where we've been happy and full of joy, I've got to tell you, you need to walk in forgiveness. You need to come out of offense. And you need to be delivered from bitterness. Bitterness corrodes everything. Honestly, you may be 100% justified in feeling the way you do. You want to know what happened at Calvary, Carlos? At Calvary, I lost my right to be right. At the cross, I laid down my right, my justification to hold on to something. I don't want to carry anything into heaven that Jesus paid for me to lay down. Stand on your feet all over the room. Every head bowed, every eye closed.